Hi guys, welcome to week four, Understanding the Play, a Theatrical Blueprint. Hopefully this won't be nearly as long as last week's, but this has got a lot of really good information as well. Um, some of it we will use for our text analysis paper, which is our second paper. Um, and some of it you may want to use for your third project paper if you were wanting to um, try your hand at a screenplay. Um, the other book I would suggest if you want to do a screenplay is um, either, you know, see if the library has it or buy from Amazon Robert McKee's Story. Um, it also breaks down all of these um, different terms and explains, you know, how to write a really good screenplay. Maybe some of you guys are screenwriters and I just don't know it, but anyway. Um, okay, there must be a plan for most theatrical performances. With few exceptions, someone has decided before the audience gathers, even before the actors are selected, basically what will happen on stage. The play is a plan or blueprint for the total production. In most cases, this means a printed text, which typically contains dialogue, words spoken by the character, as well as stage directions, written descriptions of physical or emotional action or physical appearance. The play is to some degree an outline that must be finished by the production team. It is two-dimensional until the artists make it three-dimensional. A wonderfully written play cannot ensure a fine performance but may provide a strong foundation for the successful collaboration of a team of artists. I think that's really interesting. Um, vice versa, sometimes you have plays that are better written and more interesting as plays but then you put them on stage and they totally fail. Um, in the Poetics, an early examination of dramatic literature, Aristotle identifies the components of a play. There are other approaches to studying plays, but we have chosen to present Aristotle's ideas because they are very basic and useful for understanding and analyzing many types of plays. Even though this list is, a thousand, is thousands of years old, it is still a useful place to begin. Aristotle identified six elements of a play. Plot, character, thought, language, musical, music, and spectacle. Uh, it is important to understand the definitions of the six elements because we will use them throughout this book and because they are used as a kind of shorthand by many people who work in, talk about, and write about the theater. Okay, so your plot, according to Aristotle, refers to the organization of the action of a play. Playable action is vital to a good play, but plot is not action. Plot is not a story or list of events, but an organizing principle. Plot is what gives a play its unity. Without plot, a dramatic performance would seem to be a series of random events with no observable connection. Aristotle believed that plot is the most important element because it organizes all the rest. Another term for plot is structure. Casual structure. Plays can be unified in a number of ways. The traditional Western, European, and North American drama is often organized in a linear and casual fashion. Linear plot means that the events of the drama progress forward in sequentially in time. Casual or cause to effect plot indicates that one event causes the next. Event A leads to event B which leads to event C and so forth. Without A and B there is no C. Um, they use Romeo and Juliet. I think probably a lot of us are familiar with the um, storyline and plot so sorry um, if this is a spoiler for you. The action of Romeo and Juliet could be described as the attempt of two young lovers to come together in the face of tremendous odds. If the lovers were immediately successful, Romeo and Juliet would be a very short play, but all kinds of obstacles present themselves. Romeo and Juliet meet and fall in love. Their attempts to be together are thwarted by the enmity of their families, the Capulets, Juliets, and the Montagues Romeos. A desperate attempt to escape together ends in their deaths. The, ca the casual relationship is one event to another in the play is complex, and sometimes there are multiple, po multiple possible causes for any one event, but the existence of causality is always clear. The action continually progresses forward in time in the world of the play, beginning shortly before Romeo and his friends crash the Capulet's party and ending with the suicides of the lovers and the discovery of their bodies in the Capulet tomb. At no time does the audience see action that had occurred previously. Although it is often described, we can say then that the plot or organization of Romeo and Juliet is linear and causal. 
At the heart of causal structure is the conflict of opposing forces. Two or more characters generally want the same thing, money, power, a kingdom, love, or want different things to happen, escape or justice, revolution, or consolidation of power. The forces work against each other until in some way the outcome is decided. The central conflict in Romeo and Juliet is Romeo and Juliet versus their families and friends. The lovers wish to be together. The old feud between the Capulets and Montagues keeps them apart. So the point of attack refers to the point in the story at which the playwright chooses to start dramatizing the action. Plays are highly selective in terms of the events that are included in performance, and these selections lie at the heart of the play structure. The story of the play might stretch far into the past, but the playwright selects one moment in that story to begin actually showing, rather than telling, about the progress of events. When Romeo and Juliet begins, the feud is already well established, but the lovers have not met. Okay, this has been going on in their family for generations, sounds like. Indeed, Romeo begins by professing his adoration for Rosalind. After the lovers meet, the action stretches out. Over a number of days, we witness many events in the struggle of the lovers, including their secret marriage and Romeo's banishment and return to Verona. The play, therefore, has a relatively early point of attack. The playwright chooses to dramatize most of the important incidents in the story. A play with an early point of attack is often said to be episodic. Selected dramatized moments in the story are separated by breaks in the action. Okay. Um, in contrast, when a play has a late point of attack, most of the events in the story have already happened, and we see only the last few episodes or, or only one episode dramatized. If Romeo and Juliet had a late point of attack, for example, the last few hours of the lovers' lives would be dramatized in great detail and the early events such as their first meeting would only be described. So I hope that makes sense. Basically, your point of attack, um, whether early or late, all depends on when you're entering the story. So, um, you know, if you watch um, Forrest Gump, you kind of see like his whole life story so that would be an early point of attack that you're that you're entering in on the story but if um with Forrest Gump if you entered in after uh I don't know after he's done all of the um gumbo and shrimp business and that's that would be a later point of attack and so he would reference maybe what had led up to him um, getting involved in that business before, but that's actually where the, it would be a late point of attack where it starts. Ah. As a play opens, the playwright usually sets up the dramatic situation for us by using exposition or information that is needed to understand the play. Although exposition may be introduced throughout the play, a great deal of information is typically conveyed in the first few scenes. Character and setting must be established, Crucial past events of the story, those occurring before the point of attack, must be described so that the audience can follow the casual connections as the play progresses. Sorry, page turn. However it is presented, the exposition creates a situation in which an uneasy balance of forces exists. Nothing major is happening yet, but the audience soon recognizes the potential for conflict. Okay, so your exposition is, you know, creating your storyline as far as like okay what are the problems going to be what are the obstacles what is the character going to um you know how are they going to succeed what are they going to what obstacles are they going to triumph if you just watch the reason that we go see a show or watch film is you know we want to see drama in somebody else's life right and so if they um just showed you know a film that is all about like somebody's life day to day and it's just a regular routine nothing happens except you know maybe the most dramatic thing is you get cut off like on your way to work um you know that would not be interesting um or interesting enough to keep our uh attention and so that is that is what exposition does is creates all of those things um so Within exposition, you have, um, and this is really, really, really key for um, if you want to do the screenwriting project here. The inciting incident 
is an event that destroys the uneasy balance and sets off the major conflict of the forces. The meeting of Romeo and Juliet is the inciting incident of the Shakespeare play. They fall in love at the Capulet party without knowing each other's identity, okay? So your inciting incident, where it all begins. Following the inciting incident, small units of action are dramatized that build an emotional intensity. This section of the play is called the rising action. The major forces in conflict gather information, lay plans, and pursue their own objectives or goals. Okay? The stakes are raised as the friar secretly marries Romeo and Juliet, and Romeo kills Juliet's cousin. Tybalt, in anger over the death of his friend Mercutio, Romeo's subsequent banishment and Juliet's desperate attempt to avoid a forced marriage by drinking and by drinking a sleeping potion set the stage for the climax. Which leads us to the climax of a play is the emotional high point of the action. The conflict has reached a critical stage and the outcome is finally decided. Often one side wins and the other loses. Um, the dual suicide of the lovers is the climax of Romeo and Juliet. So it's the big, 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 big ending. Emotional intensity drops during the falling action, the events from the climax to the end of the play. Loose ends are tied up for the audience and the balance is restored, although something clearly is different from the play's beginning. Other plays may include subplots or secondary lines of action in which different conflicts are developed. A subplot may be entwined with the major line of action and reach its climax in the same scene, or it may develop independently and climax at another time. Okay, so sometimes there are like other things um, that happen alongside, especially if you, it, in Romeo and Juliet, you really only have the two characters. But, um, all right, I'm just going to use this as an example since I'm really into it right now. I don't know if anybody watches Pretty Little Liars, but season five is on Netflix and I'm catching up. So subplots, um, you have your, you know, four lead characters, right? Um, Emily, Hannah, Spencer, and Aria. And then your subplots, okay, are things that are going on. Like, so all of them are trying to figure out who A is, right? But then the subplots are like the things that are happening on the side, like what is happening um, with Arya and Ezra, what's happening between Toby and Spencer, what's happening between um, Hannah and Caleb, what's happening between Emily and all of, she's got a bunch of different uh, relationships seemingly going on. So those, those are examples of subplots. You've got the four main characters and then you have all of this action happening on the outside, um, in addition to it, it can be with other characters or it can be, you know, I know they have different things going on. They're wanting to get into college and anyway, all of that. Um, but it all kind of uh, is connected back to A. Anyway, I hope there's somebody that shares my passion for Pretty Little Lives. Um, Aristotle identified two more terms that are useful in understanding plot, discovery and reversal. Discovery occurs when something important is found, learned or realized during the action of a play. The discovery might be of an object. The murder weapon is found, uh, for example, or a piece of information. The detective is actually the murderer. The most meaningful discoveries are often those that a character makes about himself or herself or about the nature of the human experience. Powerful discoveries happen in Romeo and Juliet when the lovers learn each other's true family identity, when Juliet realizes that she can no longer trust her nurse, and late in the play when Juliet awakens to find her lover's lifeless body beside her. Discovery. Reversal occurs when a line of action veers around suddenly to its opposite. So it's, um, it's the thing that you did not expect to happen. The prime suspect in a murder investigation turns up dead, for example, and the detective must look for another solution to the crime. A good example of reversal in Romeo and Juliet is Romeo's slaying of Juliet's cousin Tybalt. Until this event, the love affair has been clandestine, but there is still some hope that the couple, married in secret, might be able to reconcile their families. Tybalt's murder and Romeo's subsequent flight from Verona lead directly to the play's tragic climax. European playwrights of the 19th century perfected the use of casual structure in a type of drama called the well-made play. 
The term can be confusing since, of course, any type of play can be written or constructed well. This particular theatrical term refers to a category of drama in which a meticulous and involved plot takes precedence over all other elements. I apologize, I'm a little under the weather. Um, okay, variations on linear and casual structure of plays. A play that does not include falling action after the climax, for example, can be very disturbing. A cliffhanger stops at the climax. The outcome of the conflict is not shown. We've got all sorts of cliffhangers and pretty little liars, right? So this is, uh, just in case you miss it, this is um, when you, when a uh, playwright or screenwriter varies from um, the norm as far as the structure. Okay, so one of these is a cliffhanger. Something happens and the audience is left in suspense. You don't know how it ends. Western playwrights of the early 20th century introduced the flashback variation to linear structure. Although most of the play progresses forward in time, occasional scenes actually dramatize events that occurred in the story before the point of attack. How many movies um, movies mostly but lots of plays too can you think of where you're watching something and then there's a flashback to something that happened um, previously whether it was a couple days uh, for the character or a couple years before um, this situation happens that you're able to link the two a conversation or something that was suspicious that maybe the character was like hmm and then all of a sudden you know in the current moment they realize oh you know that's that's why that happened. Another thing they talk about is dos ex machina. All right, in ancient Greece, theater artists developed a scenic machine called um, the mechane, which was a crane-like apparatus that was capable of flying an actor or set of actors into the performance space for special effects. Um, it evolved. The Romans gave us the Latin phrase dos ex machina, God from the machine, to describe this dramatic device which over time came to stand for any contrived conclusion for a play or other forms of literature that told stories. Therefore, long after the literal God machine was no longer in use, the phrase was attached to manipulated climaxes including reversals and discoveries. In weak plays, dos ex machina might be an act of desperation by the playwright to solve an impossible dilemma. It is, however, sometimes used deliberately for satirical or effect or some kind of compl uh, commentary on the characters or the world of the play. So this is um, like you go through a film and all these terrible things happen and then all of a sudden the um, the character wakes up and it was a dream. Okay, so it's kind of like they were saved. The god of the machine, the just like they just you know the this playwright pretty much went like, Ooh, I don't know how to solve this problem, so I'm just gonna say that none of it happened or this you know. So anyway, that is that. That's a phrase I feel like you hear a lot. Okay, repetition as structure. An event, action, or line of dialogue may be repeated with or without variations and provide a kind of unity for the play. German playwright Heiner Muller, uh, Muller's Hamlet Machine in 1978, for example, uses Shakespeare's Hamlet as a jumping off place to comment pessimistically and violently on social and political failure in the modern world, especially in Europe. The play repeats distressing images and lines that become a denial of the conceptions audiences are likely to have of Hamlet and Ophelia. Hamlet even claims that he is not Hamlet, and Ophelia violates all of Shakespeare's presentation of her as soft, compliant, gentle, and chaste. Okay, so that is repetition of structure. Um, taking, you know, in this example, taking a play and then, um, you know, he kind of perverted it, but you know, changing it to to suit whatever. Uh, for Moeller, he really wanted to make a statement on the social and, and political failure in the 1970s. So he took a play that everybody knew and then tweaked it so that it represented what he felt it needed to represent. Po Hi guys, sorry, I'm back. I had to run Molly outside. Okay, um, we talk about post-structuralism. Dramatic work created after World War II that breaks down traditional Causal structure is often identified as post-structuralism. 
Many plays and performances of the last several decades are somewhat like negative photographic images of what were once positive dramatic events. The perception of concrete space becomes negative or impossible space and events are so negotiable um, as to be indefinable or so contradictory as to be adrift among definitions. It is sometimes impossible to figure out a logical story since none is presented. The last three plays mentioned have no story per se, but are rich in dramatic event images and disturbing problems. Much of the work is also metatheatrical, that is self-conscious in its presentation of theater as a theater. There are many um, antecedents for metatheater from the simplest play within a play, such as that found in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, basically, um, another one is Waiting for Godot that um, it's it is a play within a play this can be a challenging thing to to kind of compare but within the play that you're watching on the stage there's another play going on this is also um, prevalent in um, oh my gosh Natalie you've done this show Man of La Mancha, there's a play within a play going on. So um, a lot of times screenwriters and playwrights will use um, this in a negative light um, to make fun of it or, uh, you know, explain their agenda. Um, Structure in the 21st century. The theater at the end of the 20th century was characterized by great diversity and the structural experiments suggest where dramatic structure is going in the 21st century. Playwrights both called on and defied tradition, used and broke rules, pushed boundaries of structure, experimented with emphasizing various dramatic elements and shattered audience expectations. Uh, the earliest 21st century has seen a continuation of traditionally structured and long-running musicals such as Aida, Mamma Mia, Hairspray, Wicked, Spamalot, Mary Poppins, and Young Frankenstein. Fortunately, however, non-traditional structure or radically reconceived staging methods have also appeared, especially in Spring Awakening and the 2005 revival of Sweeney Todd. Playwrights such as Carol Churchill defied traditional dramatic structure to question contemporary social structure and gender limitations. Experimentation since the late 20th century has led us to question the nature of the word text itself. Beyond the spoken words, the descriptions of mimetic action became crucial to many contemporary plays. Beginning with Samuel Beckett, many playwrights have used physical action to express human singularity and frustration. Despite exciting experimentation in the United States, many playwrights of non-musical plays have been led by producers to create small cast plays, often for economic reasons. Also, performance art, usually one person, first person shows that purport to make the artist the subject of the performance, propels much of the avant-garde. In Britain, however, successful large cast, scenically diverse productions continue to appear, but most notably in the plays of Tom Stoppard, such as The Nine Hour, The, cast, the Coast of Utopia, which explores a 19th century run up to revolution in Russia with an, un, with an ensemble of some 38 actors. All right, now we go into character. Character refers to the persons that are created to perform the action of the play. Character is the element of drama that most people find the easiest to understand, probably because human beings constantly observe and interpret human behavior in everyday life. An accomplished playwright will develop a character only to the extent needed to fulfill its function in the play. We usually learn a great deal about a play's protagonist or a central character. Romeo and Juliet has dual protagonists, both are young, impulsive, and loyal to friends and family. Character credibility. Information about character is given in three basic ways. What characters say about themselves, what others say about them, and what the characters do. Characters do not always tell the truth, as in life the audience evaluates the accuracy of the character information by considering the circumstances. Levels of characterization. One way of understanding how characters are developed in a play is to consider five levels of characterization. Biological, physical, psychological, and emotional, social, and ethical. 
A minor character may be, may be developed only through the first two levels. A full and complex character will draw on all five. So going into biological traits really fast, this includes the species of the character. Usually, of course, plays are written about human beings, but important plays have included fairies, demons, monsters, animals, spirits, gods, and even robots. So what is the biology of a character? Physical traits include stature, weight, hair and eye color, and facial hair. In the theater, such traits are filled in automatically by the actor playing the role and by changes made with costume and makeup. Um, psychological and emotional traits develop the character's basic internal makeup. Richard III is angry, vengeful, clever, and ruthless. Laura is sensitive and withdrawn and lives most happily in her imagination. We will be reading that play later on. Glass Menagerie. Juliet's nurse is sympathetic but foolish. Shakespeare's Hamlet is intelligent, thoughtful, and melancholy. Social traits may include a character's job or profession, socioeconomic status, or religious or political affiliation. It is significant, for example, that Romeo and Juliet are from powerful upper-class families. Both households have many servants, friends, and relations, many of whom are actively engaged in perpetuating the old feud. Ethical traits are the moral standards held by a character. Although the audience is frequently given clues to a character's integrity by other means, an ethical or moral choice is often a defining moment for a protagonist, particularly in a tragedy. Thought refers to the ideas in a play and can be generated in a number of different ways. Sometimes a playwright will actually write a speech for a character, explicating a particular idea or arguing a point. The famous to be or not to be speech from Hamlet, for example, is an exquisitely worded argument of the most basic human question. Should I choose life or death? Use of imagery to create thought. In a complex play, meaning exists on many levels. A concept might be developed through a visual image or expressive language. The youthful muscular languages of Romeo and Juliet is made manifest in the actors climb up the balcony, only to be replaced in the end by the vision of two corpses enveloped by the sounds of mourning. Okay? Um, so that's really key as well, the use of imagery to create thought. A lot of times um, a playwright or a stage director will, um, it can be a picture, um, as far as blocking goes, uh, something that the character does, a pose they hold, or something that kind of symbolizes what will happen towards them at the end. So that's using imagery to create thought. And they give this example with Romeo and Juliet. Contribution of plot to thought. Plot is most instrumental in creating thought, what actually happens in the play, what the playwright chooses to include or exclude, how the playwright chooses to begin and end the play, has a profound effect on ideas that are communicated by the play. Romeo and Juliet would be a very different play if the events did not lead to the protagonist's death. If the lovers manage to run away and live happily ever after, the play might be seen as a celebration of the power of young love over unreasonable opposition. Instead, the tragedy dramatizes the terrible costs of prejudice and vengeance and the failure of authority figures to provide appropriate counsel and understanding to the young. It, um, it's really amazing, you know, and I think it says so much about what the playwright or screenwriter wants to um, give his audience because, yeah, Romeo and Juliet could have been, you know, lo love triumphs, you know, over everything, over any obstacle, and in, in this situation making it a tragedy, it was, you know, look at what you've done to these two young people that wanted to be together. You know, shame. Use of illusion. Many times thought in plays is communicated by illusion. References to previous art, literature, historical event, geography, and culture. When audience members recognize these references, they are likely to find parts of the play opening up in, an, up in unexpected ways. Illusion is a method of layering and texturing the play, enriching it for those who are prepared for the recognition. And this illusion is spelled A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, illusion, not illusion. They're kind of closely relink, uh, related, but this is illusion. Language. 
Language refers to the playwright's choice of words in a play. Unlike that in a poem, novel, or essay, language written for the stage must be capable of being spoken aloud. It is usually a heightened version of human speech. For many centuries, the standard language of the theater was poetry. A play written in prose, language similar to everyday um, speech, would have been considered inartistic and unworthy of production. It's probably good they're not watching our shows today. Dialogue written in verse. Poetry may have may have a rhyme scheme or just a specific rhythm. Shakespeare's plays are written largely in blank verse. The lines are not rhymed but have a specific set rhythm. The rhythm is often iambic pen, um, pentometer, which means that there is a stress on each second syllable and five stresses per line. I'm sure um, if any of you have had uh, Professor Yatsko, uh, it's voice and articulation or voice and movement, one of the two, but I'm sure he goes over that. The use of figurative language often enriches dramatic dialogue. When Romeo declares Juliet is the sun, he uses a metaphor, equating two unlike objects to suggest a similarity between them, to convey the importance Juliet has assumed in his life. Juliet uses a simile. Comparing two unlike things using like or as to link the depth of her love to that of the ocean. Sensory images bring the physical world of the play um, alive for the audience and helps to convey the character's experience of environment as when Romeo describes the dawn. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severing clouds in yonder east. Juliet's use of hyperbole overstatement suggests her impatience when she insists that tis twenty years until the next morning. Um, isn't that like a typical teenager too? Like, you know, it's gonna be forever. No, it's just an hour from now. It is okay. In most plays, dialogue moves back and forth between characters. When one character speaks for an extended period, the speech is called a monologue. If the character is alone on stage, or if the other characters are not supposed to hear the words such as a speech, it is called a soliloquy. A brief remark by a character meant to be heard by the audience, but not the other characters, is called an aside, and normally they do this little hand gesture. Asides and soliloquies appear frequently in presentational plays. All right, we are almost done talking about music. Music has been very important in the theater of most cultures, and in many cases it has been vital. At the time that Aristotle made his analysis, some dialogue and many choral um, passages in the Greek theater seem to have been chanted and or sung accompanied by instrumental music. Music is a powerful tool for encouraging emotional identification. It can increase suspense, excitement, sadness, and happiness. In Western musical theater, song is frequently used to express heightened emotion. But following the model of Brecht, song is sometimes used to interrupt the story or emotional development and present ideas about class struggles, corruption in the palaces of power, and the plight of the poor. How many times when you see a show is it not until the music comes in for a really sad section that you start crying? Maybe it's just me, but... I think there are more folks out there. All right, spectacle. Spectacle refers to the visual elements called for in a play. It could include scenery, costumes, props, light, light, lighting, goodness gracious, actor, physicality, and movement, and can offer a satisfying sensory experience. In any given play, the six elements, plot, character, thought, language, music, and spectacle work, to create, uh, work together to create a special world on the stage. But bam, mm, maybe a little over 30 minutes. Um, awesome. You have discussion boards due on Thursday by 11.59 p.m. And two responses to two other friends. Again, um, anytime you have an opportunity, uh, Adam's Family opens this week for me, but anytime you have an opportunity, please go see a play and do the live theater critique. I know it's um, it's counted as your final, but you don't want to be starting to think about that come Thanksgiving and then there are no shows for you to see. So begin working on that. And um, we also have your first paper coming up due, I think, I don't have my syllabus in front of me, so don't judge, but I think it's October 4th. Fourth, or sometime in October. 
Um, I will double check that and email that to you. Um, you've already, you should have it, you do have it in your syllabus, and I know I've mentioned it in other emails, I just can't remember off the top of my head when that is. Um, but, and that is from chapter one, I believe, um, the different types of theater or theater and. Okay, have an awesome week, guys.